your name and spell it? My name is John Fasulo, F-A-S-U-L-O. Okay, and um, how long have you lived in the Hudson Valley? I grew up here. Um, I'm 59 years old. I was born in 1949 in Cold Spring, and uh, but we, we lived in, in Beacon, New York. Um, my parents, my, uh, on my mother's side, moved here <clears throat> when she was one year old in 1923 from Germany at the end of World War I. Um, you know, Europe was in shambles, and uh, that was a time that a lot of people left. My grandfather, when he got here, um, was hired by the railroad and worked as a, as a machinist at uh, the Harmon shops for about 30 years. So you've had a, a, a strong connection to the railroads going back some time with your father. My grandfather. Your grandfather. Um, for, for, well, for a long time. I mean, he, he was the person that introduced me both to uh, photography and to uh, uh, my my continued love for photographing uh, railroads and, and railroad workers. Did he bring you around the shop to? Uh, he did. Um, we would take the train uh, on a Saturday and as he was an employee uh, we would ride for free and we would stop at Croton Harmon uh, to the shop where he worked and we would spend about an hour and he'd take me through and he'd say, you know, I, I'm working on taking that engine apart next week and I put that one together last week and as a, you know, eight or nine year old boy I said, wow, you know, what a great job my grandfather has. And then we'd continue on in, into New York and, and make our, our normal rounds which were to Polk's Hobby Shop and uh, FAO Schwartz and a few other places and, uh, you know, I was always amazed by the size of uh, Grand Central Terminal, uh, something that I've since photographed a number of times. Um, but on our way in and on our way out, uh, I had my head glued to the window. And between Beacon and New York, uh, we're on what was called uh, by the New York Central the water level route, um, the, the great passenger train, the 20th Century Limited. Uh, ran from New York to Chicago along this route uh, and through Beacon, and I would often see it whizzing by as we were taking the, the local uh, in or out of uh, Grand Central. But I had my head glued to the window uh, on our way in, and, you know, I was, you know, amazed by, you know, the countless number of boats, you know, going up and down the river and, and the river's wide range of views from, from being uh, a way to for America to transport its goods on barges and, and even large freighters all the way to the port of Albany, as well as, you know, the ferries that, uh, that crossed the river. Uh, at the time, actually, in my lifetime, the only one that was left in the upper Hudson was the ferry between Newburgh and Beacon, and that ended service in 1963 when the first bridge crossed uh, the river, bringing 80, Interstate 84 across the Hudson. Did your grandfather ever uh, share any stories about what life was like working for the railroads and the colorful characters he may have encountered? Well, he certainly, you know, he, he, was, he was a machinist, so he was in the shop most of the time. Um, you know, I really don't remember, um, you know, colorful... Casey Jones type of, of stories from him, um, but he, he, he certainly made that world uh, available to me and, and, and appealing, and to this day, um, now being retired from, from the television industry, one of the things that, that I'm focusing on uh, as a still photographer that I've done all along, even when I was uh, a cameraman, uh, in the city, uh, focusing on, on still photography of uh, railroads and railroad workers. Um, I have one photograph of my grandfather. We, we called him Pop. Everybody called, called him Pop. And uh, it was a photograph that I took of him on one of our trips uh, into the city 
uh, when we were at Harmon, uh, sitting in a, in, a, in a diesel engine at the engineer's position, you know, posing, you know, for, for me, for my, my portrait of him. And I think I was about 10 when, when, when I did that. So there are, you know, these, these memories and, and having a, a grandfather, uh, you know, who was, you know, willing to, on his weekend, uh, you know, five days a week, he was working at, at the shop at Harmon, you know, to, to take a seven, eight, nine, ten year old, eleven year old boy on the train, which he rode every day, you know, to and from work, uh, you know, to take me, you know, into the city. Uh, and to, to Harmon, you know, gave a lasting Im impression um, and certainly, you know, started my, my visual career uh, as, as well as, you know, the, the, the love of trains. You mentioned uh, your professional work in uh, television. Can you <coughs> speak to that for a bit? Well, I, I spent 25 years um, as uh, a cameraman uh, in New York. Um, I like to tell people that I worked for the alphabet, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News, uh, some of those places as, as a freelancer, uh, some on staff. Um, uh, early on, um, a, a good friend who has recently passed away, Larry Dahlstrom, uh, who was uh, uh, an audio genius um, and worked for a number of companies putting, uh, building um, remote trucks uh, for remote sports and, and, and other uh, live broadcasts. But Larry uh, knew the chief engineer at the time of Channel 9 and uh, helped to get me a position as a summer relief cameraman. And a few of the first shows that I worked on were Romper Room, Live, and Joe Franklin's Memory Lane, and uh, the, the Channel 9 uh, news in, at noon and, and in the evening. Um, you know, from there I, I went on to, to work on uh, Geraldo's uh, first uh, audience show uh, called Geraldo, and, and was there for the for the famous Nazi skinhead confrontation that resulted in uh, Geraldo's nose being broken. Uh, I was securely ensconced be behind my camera. Uh, you know, a big studio pedestal camera is, is, a, is a great shield. Uh, and when the chair started to fly, uh, um, the control room uh, apparently took the wide shot and the other cameras. I was on a camera that got tight shots of, of interactions between Geraldo and, and guests. And I had a wonderful over-the-shoulder shot of Geraldo pummeling, you know, this, this guy, but they didn't take it. Um, I, I think they were afraid of, you know, future lawsuits and they felt it safer to just keep one camera on recording and that was the, the camera that was getting the wide shot. Uh, television history, and I was there. You know. um, it sounds like you worked with a, a diverse group of pretty eccentric personalities. Um, probably to say the least, yeah. I mean, you know, television, uh, uh, when, when, when people ask me about it, I, I tell them that television was better than working for a living. Um, you know, fortunately, most of my experiences in, in television were, were positive. Um, you know, there were times, uh, you know, like uh, we're going through now where, uh, you know, funding got cut for certain programs and, you know, you got laid off. And one of the times that, that I found myself with, without a job in New York, um, something came up with WTZA where they needed to find, uh, hire a producer for On the River and also needed uh, a chief cameraman for the news department, neither of which paid enough uh, to, to live on. <laughs> um, but I managed to, um, to talk with, um, 
Henry Marcotte and, and, and management, and we, we came to uh, an, an agreement where, where I, I did both jobs for a salary that, uh, that I, I, I could live on for, for a while and, until uh, I thought I would be able to find something back in New York. Um, so I produced on the river and also shot news and, and oversaw the, uh, the, the other news crews. I think we had three other news crews out shooting. Um, and on the river was a great job, uh, especially for me. I, I, I have a, a background and love for history, uh, for the Hudson Valley and the Hudson River. And uh, so I could, I could pick up the phone and uh, call the Coast Guard in New York as, as, a, as a Coast Guard veteran. Uh, call the PR department and, and you know, say, listen, you know, like, you, there's a lot going on this winter in the Hudson, you know, because of heavy ice, you know, can you get me into a helicopter? The next day I was in a helicopter uh, or on one of the Coast Guard icebreakers, you know, the Penobscot Bay or the Sturgeon Bay, um, or on a buoy tender in, in the spring or in the fall, uh, putting in or replacing uh, the ice buoys. Um, and just because of my, my interest in and in growing up in the Hudson Valley uh, over the years, I, I, I knew uh, or, or knew people who knew uh, who to contact for, for a certain story. Um, so it was, it was the perfect job. You know, I wish, it was, I wish it could continue. Can you recall some of your favorite uh, stories maybe that you covered on the river? I think the, the, the one story that, that stands out is uh, a show that I did with uh, Lincoln DeMont, who wrote the book Chaining of the Hudson. Um, actually, two shows came out of that, that book, uh, one on the chain at West Point and the other on the revolutionary submarine, the Turtle, uh, which was put into the river in the Yonkers area and floated downstream with, uh, I think it's Israel Putnam was the, the soldier who was put in charge of and operated the, the submarine to try and, and put a cask of powder with a timer underneath a British warship in New York Harbor. Um, and oddly enough, um, the reason that Israel Putnam failed was because he really had no knowledge of ships and when he was underneath the British warship where he tried to drill with the auger um, to leave the, the rope that was attached to the keg, he was drilling into the iron chain plate um, and he didn't know why he couldn't drill into this boat. Um, so eventually he left uh, the keg, which floated from underneath, and he left and tried to get back up the Yonkers. Uh, the keg exploded a few hundred feet away from the British ship, and the, the first use of a submarine in warfare uh, by any country um, failed, but the attempt was still made. So, you know, history was... History was made that day, even if we, we, we didn't succeed. So those were, the, there were two shows, the one on the chain and, and the one uh, with, with, and Lincoln DeMont, uh, who is now, uh, I think, in his mid-80s, uh, at the time um, was, was the, the narrator of the show with me. We, we went down to the Intrepid, and there was a, I forget the name of the submarine that's, that's uh, at the Intrepid Museum, uh, I think a World War II or Cold War submarine. And Lincoln DeMont, very quickly, we, we, we did three or four takes, but he did one. His first take, the intro to the show, you know, was, was you know, we're standing here on the Hudson River on this submarine here at the Intrepid Museum, and who would have thought that 200 and some odd years ago uh, the Americans used uh, a, a one-man submarine to try and blow up a ship in New York Harbor. 
you know, and he did that in one take and had never done anything in front of the camera before. And it was, it was just amazing to work with him. He was a wonderful, knowledgeable man. We became, you know, very good friends. Uh, I haven't talked to him in, in a while. Uh, he's retired and living up in Massachusetts now. Um, but two, two very wonderful shows that, that you actually have here uh, at, at Marist since, since you, you know, acquired all of the, the rights to the Hudson uh, the, on, on the River uh, TV shows. Well, one of the, um, the reasons for these, uh, these interviews is, of course, to uh, celebrate the Poughkeepsie Railroad Bridge and tell its, sto its story. And one of the ways you fit into this is because you were not only a witness to the fire, but also uh, you were up there and got to photograph. So can you tell us a little bit about what happened that day? How did you first see the fire? Um, I was thinking about it driving up here today because that's what I was doing at the time. I was uh, on my way to Poughkeepsie. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly what for, but uh, somewhere around uh, IBM, I, I, I first noticed black smoke rising somewhere uh, over the, the western part of the, the city of Poughkeepsie. As, as I got closer, uh, I realized uh, that it was a fire uh, on the railroad bridge, and traffic was being diverted off of uh, off of Route Nine because the bridge, uh, you know, crosses uh, the arterial, and they didn't want cars going underneath uh, underneath the bridge. Um, so I I got off with the rest of traffic. Uh, somewhere, you know, south of, of the bridge around, probably somewhere around the uh, cemetery. And uh, I, I wound my way up to Parker Avenue where, where the, the tracks come out onto, onto grade level. I parked, grabbed my camera bag. There was nobody around. Uh, and so I said, well, let me get out onto the bridge as far as I can go and get as many photographs as I can before somebody stops me. Um, as I was going out onto the bridge, uh, the Poughkeepsie, one of the Poughkeepsie Journal photographers, uh, his name was Whitey. Uh, it, was, <clears throat> it was a nickname, and Whitey was, was um, <clears throat> uh, legally blind uh, al albino. Uh, he could see shapes and he could make things out, uh, but I, I don't think he drove a car. And he was walking out onto the bridge as I was, so we kind of teamed up and uh, <clears throat> we got out to uh, where the firemen were and um, they were busy fighting the fire, so, you know, they didn't say anything to us. And we started, you know, you know doing what we do, uh, you know, photographing the event. Um, <clears throat> After about maybe 15 or 20 minutes, I, I happened to look over the railing of the bridge and realized <clears throat> that we were um, over the top of uh, a propane tank farm that was being hosed down by uh, the fire department. So I told Whitey, you know, where we were and that maybe we better, you know, get our behinds out of here. Uh, and he concurred, you know, so, you know, we, we beat it off the bridge and um, I knew that the Poughkeepsie Journal would have enough photographs because their photographer was there, so I ran down <clears throat> to the Newburgh uh, Beacon News uh, office in, in Newburgh where I knew Al Rhodes, who was the... Uh, uh, was the editor of the paper at the time. And I walked into his office and I stood in the doorway and he was on the phone. He was on two phones. You know, it was kind of like out of, a, you know, a, a 1930s movie about, uh, you know, about a, a, a newspaper in Chicago somewhere. You know, and he was, he was saying into both phones loudly and with some anger, I don't care. You know, find me somebody who's got photographs of, of that bridge fire. <laughs> and 
He looked up at me and saw that I had two rolls of Tri-X in my hands. This was prior to, you know, digital photography. Um, and he said, what's that? And I said, hang up the phones. I've got your, your bridge fire photos. Um, and I think for my, for my endeavors, I, I, three photos got published and I made like $35. Bought some more film. So what was the the situation like up on the bridge? I mean, was there a lot of confusion where people, the firemen seemed to be really, really <clears throat> at it? Well, they they were they were doing the best that they that they could, but the the water mains that were on the bridge, to my understanding, um, were useless. Either either there was not enough pressure, or they didn't work at all. So they, they had to run hose uh, from, uh, I believe they ran hose from both sides of, of the bridge. Maybe they just ran hose from one side. But they also had ladder trucks extended as, as high as they could get, um, you know, to try and, you know, get this fire under control. Um, and the reason that it burned, uh, so fast and as hot and smoked as much as it did was that what was burning were the creosote ties, you know, and creosote is a very, very flammable uh, uh, substance. Um, there were probably 15 or 20 firemen uh, out on, on the bridge at the time. Uh, eventually, they you know they did get the fire under control, but I think uh, enough damage uh, <clears throat> was done to the bridge that uh, it was never used uh, uh, again as as a railroad bridge, or un until uh, the recent uh, interest and in, and in subsequent laying of of the new walkway, you know that'll open later. In, in the year, um, you know, the, the bridge sat for years, uh, you know, there were people that wanted to tear it down, there were people that wanted to, I, th I remember a, a photograph in an article in probably the journal uh, about somebody wanting to turn it into a mall. They wanted to put uh, walls over the sides of, of the, the superstructure and, and turn the bridge into a, into a uh, not, not, a, not a mall as in a walking mall, but a shopping mall. That was probably the biggest harebrained scheme that, 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 uh, that, that we, we've heard about here. But, um, you know, the history of the bridge, uh, it's on the National Register of Historic Places, you know, and was completed in the 1880s. Uh, so it's um, it's it's heartening and and good to see you know that that this bridge is going to uh, be cared for and that the pedestrian walkway is is going to become a reality. Back to that deck, you uh, speak about maybe some sensory um, remembrances. <coughs> was there a strong smell as the bridge was on fire? Did you feel heat? It shook a number of times, um, and you know there was the smell of of the burning creosote from the, from the ties and and the heat. It was it was early May of 1974, um, and I don't believe it to be have been a very hot day. Um, you know I think it was you know partially overcast. Um, but the, um, the, the, the one thing, the, the two things that, that I remember are being shocked back into reality that I was standing over, you know, a propane tank farm that was being hosed down by the fire department and, and having the, the bridge shake under my feet. Um, it didn't keep me from going out onto the bridge or continuing to take photographs, uh, you know, as, as, as a news cameraman and, 
you know, later on, I mean, I, I, in 1974, I, I hadn't gotten into the, my, my career as, as a cameraman, but, um, you know, you, 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 you take risks or, you, you know, you tend not to get the best shots. Um, when I had what I thought I needed, then it was time to go. I didn't need to be there anymore. Um, and while we were out there, the, the firemen, I think, were, were, were too busy to, to really, no one said anything to us. You know, they, they knew Whitey, uh, and I think maybe they assumed that I was a photographer from another newspaper, which in a way I was, because I had done some freelancing for, for the, the evening news, and that's how I knew our roads. Um, but it's one of the, you know, one of the, the memorable times uh, in, in my life, you know, and it was, you know, the, the, the thing of being in the right place at the right time. So let me bring you up to um, some of the current ideas for the bridge and the, the walkways it's going to be, be finished. Um, have you, are you interested in going up onto that bridge? And are you going to be one of the people who utilize the bridge as a walkway? Or? Oh, sure. Um, looking at, at some of the photographs that, that have been published of the, the walkway, you know, being built, I, I think they have some of the walkway already out. They, they've started from the west end of the bridge going east. And, you know, uh, being out on the bridge uh, without the, the secure... Uh, platform that's that's be now being built uh, is a is a relatively scary proposition. Um, I went out uh, about a year and a half ago with a, a group uh, when this whole idea of the walkway was was being talked about and and initiated, and we didn't even go out. We didn't go out more than a quarter of the way and. And uh, even though it originally was a bridge that uh, was double-tracked, um, you know, when you're out in the middle of that bridge, uh, it's, it, it, can, it can be, with the wind blowing, you know, and the bridge, you know, bridges, all bridges m shake and move. You know, they, they, they need to because that's, you know, the design and, and part of the, the structure is that, they they have they expand. Um, with the walkway, uh, I th I think you know most people, unless they really have a you know a, a fear of heights, uh, will feel relatively secure on the bridge. And I, I think it's uh, a, a great thing to see the the bridge being able to be used by uh, more more people. I mean, up until this point, it it, it hasn't been able. To be to really be used by by anybody except for, you know, the people working on it or, you know, keeping it stable or um, involved in 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 what's what's happening with the bridge now. Um, one thing that I had mentioned uh, to to some of the people involved uh, in in this effort, uh, and I I think certainly not to their liking, unfortunately, was that the width of um, the new walkway, um, I believe, would accommodate uh, a narrow gauge light rail. And, you know, throughout the country with, with uh, the, the need for, for transportation, the re need for renewed interest and the renewed interest in, in railroads and, and that infrastructure. Um, a light rail, narrow gauge, like a trolley, you know, that went from somewhere east of Poughkeepsie, across the bridge, along the right of way uh, to New Paltz and, and south to, to Maybrook, um, might be something, you know, to at least bandy about and uh, and see if it uh, is something that eventually uh, could be incorporated into the bridge. One thing I want to do, I want to see 
see if you uh, want to uh, let you look at some of your photographs and kind of talk about what the camera was seeing. What we could do seeing. that, sure. Let me just, I'll bring them over. Do you want to use... Do you want to use the small yeah. book? I think um, it's the other book, oh, okay. the other small book. Uh, because the students have that, so we'll look at some of the... Uh, I think, think he has it in the control room. I'll grab it. Oh, no, it's right there. Ah, right. Yeah. Um, this is probably one of the first photographs that I took when I got out onto the bridge, uh, having parked at uh, Parker Avenue and getting on the tracks at, at grade level, where, where I met Whitey from the Poughkeepsie Journal. You can, you can see the firemen in the distance, um, where the, the smoke is rising from the structure. You know, the wind was blowing from the south. Uh, I'm going out onto the bridge from from the east shore, and when we got out further, uh, we basically got right into the middle of the mix with, with the firemen. You know, this photograph wasn't taken with a telephoto lens, you know, it was taken with a, probably a 28 millimeter wide angle lens, and, you know, shows a couple of the firemen coming back, the, the fire burning, you know, quite uh, heavily behind them, and uh, did the smoke uh, get into your eyes? Was it? Yeah, was it was. It was. It was yeah, there was a. There was a. You know, there was an like an. There was an acrid, an acrid taste. Um, you know, it wasn't a hot day, but you know, creosote burns. Uh, I I think uh, at a at a high temperature, and you know the the, the firemen were. Um, you can see from this picture shows uh, two or three lines, uh, hoses, that are what you would call charged because they're, they're full and round and so there's, you know, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a charge in these hoses and there's a, another group of hoses that, that aren't being used yet and I'm not sure if they ever were. Um, but I, I believe it was firemen from the city of Poughkeepsie and from from other from certainly from Highland across the river, um, and other local fire departments that that fought this this blaze. That's, that's about that's about it. Okay. Um, anything you'd like to add? Anything you'd like to to say? It's Valley but the bridge. Um, well, I think, you know, I'm, I'm going, I think tonight at 5 o'clock um, in Poughkeepsie, there's a, a Chamber of Commerce meeting, and the, the people that uh, the walkway over the Hudson group uh, are going to be there doing a presentation that, that I've been invited to attend. Um, I think that with the uh, 2009 year of uh, festivals and festivities on the Hudson, you know, the fact that uh, hopefully by, I think, September, they're looking at uh, having the walkway completed. Um, the bridge at one point was uh, in danger of, of being torn down. Um, uh, shipping along the river uh, saw it as a hazard. Uh, it wasn't being used. Um, you know, people said it was uh, rusting away and was it was parts of it were in danger of falling onto the highway uh, that ran underneath Route 9. Um, and it's to the credit of uh, the walkway over the Hudson people uh, and their uh, dauntless endeavor to raise the funds uh, to do this project uh, that, uh, you know, will we'll keep the bridge intact 
and available uh, for you know generations to come uh, to both learn about the river, you know, to walk across the bridge, and to look north and to look south, and and see uh, a river that uh, for generations has um, held people in its spell, uh, created a movement uh, of painters, the Hudson River School. Um, spawned numerous books, um, got the Clearwater built to help uh, rid it of its contamination. Uh, Clearwater, I think, is uh, having a birthday this year, as is Pete Seeger, who is going to be 90. Um, and, you know, countless organizations uh, have been fighting for a river that's uh, not the longest in the world. Um, some would say, you know, the Rhine, uh, you know, has its castles and, and, and is, you know, grander in, in that respect. But, you know, I've been on the Rhine and, you know, the Hudson having grown up here and taken the train into the city and, you know, as a young boy and with my nose glued to the, to the window or the ferry uh, from Beacon to Newburgh um, prior to, to 1963. Uh, luckily at that time, uh, I was on one of the last boats, you know, to make that trip from Beacon to Newburgh. Um, November the 7th, I believe it was, 1963, shortly before Kennedy was killed. Um, and the boat got to Newburgh or got to Beacon, and the last boat, the last two boats crossed, and the captains, you know, pulled on their, on their, their whistles, you know, with long blasts from each one as they crossed one another to go to Beacon or to Newburgh. And the ferries, when they got to Beacon, and when the ferry got to Newburgh, you know, the, the pilot, the, the captain of the ferry signaled the engine room, the traditional finished with engines. And they were indeed finished with engines for the last time. Uh, it was a moving time, you know, it was, it was the end of an era, uh, 220 years of uh, ferry service uh, on the river at, at Beacon and Newburgh. And uh, progress, you know, came along as it always does, and uh, the bridge opened and the ferry uh, stopped uh, its service. Great. Thank you yeah. very much. Oh. Okay. I hope you got what you wanted. I think so. <laughs> I think that was uh, some really good stuff. Okay, James.